Okay, now that we know that we want to see signatures, I'm still holding off and I'm going to tell you first something about an identification scheme. There's a good reason for this, namely that you can build signatures from such an identification scheme. So an identification scheme is, well, as I said, you're identified by knowing your secret key. So Alice has published her Q, which is A times P, and she is the person who knows A. So how can she prove to Bob that she actually knows A? So an identification protocol is something interactive, and we see here some data flow. So you always read this from the end of the arrow to the, well, from the start of the arrow from that side to the direction where the arrow is pointing. So this starts first, then we go here, then comes here. Now this arrow points right to left, and so this happens, well, if nothing happens here. And then the last one is actually interesting. We start on the left, then send it over, and then go to the right here. So what is happening there? So Alice at the very beginning picks a number r, which is between 0 and n minus 1. Oh yeah, so n is the order of p, and everybody knows p, everybody knows n, everybody knows how to compute with, with elements of this elliptic curve, so p and q are elliptic curve points. And then it might be an Edwards curve, might be a curve. Oh, I've gone with that. Um, so what Alice is doing, she picks a random scalar there, and she computes r times p. Okay, so she sends this capital R over to Bob, and then Bob similarly picks a random challenge from the same set. That's the H. Note the asymmetry here. So what Alice sends to Bob is a discrete log problem. So Alice sends R, uppercase R, which does encapsulate the lowercase R, but Bob doesn't get to see lowercase R. But she commits to the lowercase R. Then what Bob sends to Alice is a scalar. And then what Alice computes, and now this is of course where the secret key comes in, for level case A, um, is this equation. So she takes the R that she shows, the H that Bob sent, and her long-term secret key A, uh, computes the sum and product, and reduces this modular group order. The reduction is useful because it saves bandwidth, but also she doesn't want to reveal how much larger than n it was. Now in the right side where Bob is verifying it, you will see that s is used as the multiple of p, and while p has order n, so everything that involves p will automatically reduce mod n. So there's also no information lost that wouldn't be lost here anyway. So what Bob does is he computes s times p, and he checks whether that is equal to the r that Alice sends in the first step, plus h times q, using the h that he picked in the second step and the Q that is Alice's public key. Now, having seen the double scalar modification, you actually realize that you could do this a little bit faster. You could move the H times Q over to the other side and compute SP minus HQ with a double scalar modification and then just check whether this is R. I kept this this way because it's easier to see on the slide that this is actually correct. So, well, let's see whether it's correct. So the claim is that if Alice knows A, so if everything is validly chosen, then the verification works out. So we just plug in what S is actually like. So S times P, we plug in what S is, that's the R plus HA. And then we cross multiply. So the lowercase r times P, that's our uppercase R from the first step up here. And then the A times P, that's Alice's public key from up here, so that's Q. So then we cross multiply, so we're getting H times Q here and capital R there. And that's exactly what she puts in for the verification. Okay, so Alice can prove that she knows A. I mean, she can survive these steps if she knows A. But does it prove that she does know A? Actually, the way it's written, yes, but it is very important to understand where this hinges on. So let's assume that the protocol works a little bit different. Let's assume she knows H before sending R. Like, similar to a diffie hellman key exchange, both start at the same time, and A sends something, B sends something, and maybe derives in this order, maybe derives in that order. So whatever the reason, let's assume she knows 
Bob's choice before. How could she cheat this? She needs to come up with an S so that the R which she now can pick, depending on H and Q, verifies even if she doesn't know A. Note that she need not know the discrete log of R to make this work. So what she can do, she can put R equal to minus HQ. Okay, so then over here on the right, this would be the neutral element, so infinity on the Weierstrass curve or 0, 1 on the Edwards curve. And that matches the scalar which she knows totally. She knows that 0 times P gets this neutral element. So yes, this would be a valid signature. Would be well, would be a valid identification transcript. She's sending minus HQ for R and S equals 0. Now it's also kind of, yeah, it's obvious and it's raised suspicion. But what she can always do, think about it for a moment, she can always move some of the multiples into R. So she can actually pick a random S and then I'm taking, instead of taking R equals minus HQ, she takes SP minus HQ. And then again, well, if she takes this plus HQ and compares with SP, that is correct, this is equal. Now, if you actually follow this protocol, so if this is step one and only after step one does Bob release his step two H, then she has a chance of guessing H correctly. Yes, she can figure out that it's one of those n choices, and let me assume it's 23. But that is a 1 over n chance of guessing it. And it would only take her square root of n time to compute a. So she would have a better investment in breaking this protocol by running her resources on breaking the discrete log, so getting a, than by hoping to have picked the right h. So that gets a check mark. Now, if for a fixed R, so once she has committed to an R, going fully in order, if then she could answer two of these challenges. So you could say, okay, well, the, this doesn't really prove anything. Um, there's still this guessing probability. Let's modify the protocol and let's send two challenges. So if Bob sends H1 and H2, which are different, um, that actually does prove that she knows A. Mm, unfortunately, that also leaks her key. So um, that's not how we should change the protocol. And I will have this on the exercise for this Tuesday that you can check that you can actually compute this A. So yes, it proves that she knows A, but it proves it in a way that actually lets Bob compute A. Um, this way of proving it by saying, okay, we stop here and then we send two different choices. If she can answer those, we can from there compute it. It's a very typical way of proving it. It's related to soundness as a property of the protocol. Um, but it also means as a warning sign, if you use such a protocol, you must never ever reuse an R for which you might get two different H values. Another thing we get from these considerations here, well, this was about Alice fooling Bob into believing that she knows A while she doesn't, if she knows H before. But if Bob is just looking at the transcript, so transcript of a protocol is the set of publicly sent messages. So it's the R, the H, and the S. So Bob could have produced this whole thing without Alice. So Bob can produce valid transcripts, transcripts that verify at the end, and he can do this without interaction with Alice. So he can do this, getting the same information, um, without anything that involves A, and so this actually proves that the uh, this identification scheme is zero knowledge, so that there is no information on A leaked to Bob by seeing this transcript. So this is another positive thing, and also, well, a consequence too. Um, I said it's seen as a security property, it's seen as soundness. Um, be aware that this is there. I see it as a warning, but I do put a check mark there. But we actually want signatures. We don't want identification protocols. Signatures are not interactive. 
I mean, think of all the places that you use signatures. See, they happen in uh, operating system upgrades. It would be kind of inconvenient if your computer, in order to install an upgrade, has to first communicate with whoever is the person holding the secret key. Say, you have a Linux system and there's uh, the Debian developer who signed this release. Uh, and then, well, it's three in the morning, his time, and you're ready to install because for you it's three in the afternoon. Um, that person might not be so excited to do an interactive proof with you just to get the uh, assert uh, the certainty that it was actually you who sent this. Also, this is not including the message. We want to sign a message. Now, those two things combined with the properties of hash function that we know actually come as a solution. So, we want to have a, a data flow where instead of having just the proof that I know A, I want to have the proof that, well, I have used A on something uh, where I couldn't cheat, apart from a probability of 1 over n, say, and I prove to you that I used my A. And Bob can verify this much, much later. Well, one of the examples of signatures is the last will would be another problematic thing for uh, having interactive proofs. Now, how can we replace this site? So we now want to cross out Bob and have Alice do everything herself. Well, two of those things come from her. But there is one thing that comes from Bob. So you might think, okay, well, let's just Alice choose H. But as I've seen on the, on the previous slide, that would be a really bad idea. I mean, even if she doesn't choose it, if she does knows it in advance, she can already cheat the system. So that is not what you're going to do. So we're going to use the hash function, the message, to compute an H, which is then enforced. So the hash function says, well, you have now, um, you take the hash of the message, and that means if the message ever changes, it would get a different H. And it computes as an H that is not under the control of Alice. So hash functions or properties, she can't pick an H that she likes and then find a message that fits it. Other properties of hash function that we're relying on here to make the signature system meaningful is that uh, signatures are collision, uh, sorry, that hash functions are collision resistant, so that you don't have just two different messages which provide you with the same H value. Because if so, then Alice could substitute one message for the other, those would be valid for this for the signature. Or worse, Bob could ask her to sign some innocent looking message while having a second colliding message that is something that Alice wouldn't like to sign. Say, you ask me to sign that, okay, you can be um, five minutes late with your homework this week, not what I want, but something I would probably sign. And then if the message if the signature is also good for, hey, I'm getting a 10 on the exam, um, I wouldn't be so happy. Now, if you manage to do this with our current schemes, you probably deserve a 10, but as a general principle, um, you should, um, it should not be possible to, to substitute messages. But there's still a problem. If this is how we choose the H, well, this is deterministic. Once Alice knows what message she wants to sign, she can compute the H, and so she can do so before having to commit to R. And that's what we just seen on the previous slide is a big problem. So Schnorr signatures actually choose the H somewhat differently. Namely, while well, they enforce the ordering. So how can you make sure that you get H only after having computed R? So what you can do is you can define the um, hash function to be taking R as one of the inputs. So if we define the hash of the H value to be hash of R, and this is where the commitment goes, and then the message. One of the properties of hash functions was that you can compute the hash only if you know the entire message of which you're computing the hash. So it's a commitment to the content. And so this way of choosing H um, enforces that R was picked, whether it's by picking lowercase r or by picking chances of taking uppercase r first, that's not our problem, but r was there 
before age was computed. And again, you can't modify R at this moment because hash functions are pretty much resistant and the second pretty much resistant. Okay, so now very short, this is how signatures for Schnorr look like. So it's mostly the same as in the interactive protocol with the only difference that we just discussed at length how the age is chosen. So similarly to before, Alice picks some lowercase r in lower, less than the group order. She computes capital R, which is R times P. She then computes, rather than have Bob send her, H, which is the hash of this capital R that she just computed in the message. And then she computes a signature equation as equal to R plus HA mod N. So all of these steps are the same as up here, except for here is a random choice. And here this random choice is made deterministic based on the R and the M. So the verification works just the same. So this is the Schnorr signature scheme and uh, similar to how I showed you a famous instantiation for the dp hellman key exchange, I'm now going to show you one for the Schnorr signature scheme, namely at DSA, or in particular for that, the at 2519. And this is the curve in Edwards form, or twisted Edwards form, that corresponds to curve 2519, the one that I showed you in the Montgomery slides. So it's the same prime, and then it's the curve that is birational equivalent to the curve on those slides. So the um, A parameter, I'm not using A here because A is also my secret key, so here's a minus x squared, and the D, that is this term. Well, if you compute this mod P, it gets a long thing which is full size, but remember that our formulas uh, for projective coordinates are able to handle numerators and denominators separately, and for that these are two small constants, so it's actually nicer to keep these as fractions of small constants rather than expanding it to a number of the size of p. Then the base point of the system, this p that we are supposed to know, well, I'm writing order n for general order, but we have seen the discrete log discussions that we always want to have prime order. So we also pick this base point to have prime order. And actually, um, what is true for this particular curve is that if you look at all points on the curve over fp, that is eight times a prime. And so you're picking some kind of point and you multiply it by eight, you very likely get a point of order L. Um, the point that we're using here is actually a specified point namely the point which has x coordinate 4 over 5 and then a y coordinate which makes this equation hold such that the x coordinate is well between 0 and p minus 1 over 2. And then at 2519 or at DSA in general is essentially the same as Schnorr's signature scheme except for there's some more improvements. One is um, that the hash computation, so how this H is chosen, and of course this is also verified later on, um, is also including the, Q, the Q. So that if somebody would be able, hypothetically, to compute collisions, or with a lot of effort, find one collision, and has done so for the same R and different M's, or maybe two different R's and different M's, um, they couldn't reuse this on many people. So enforcing that the public key of Alice also goes in here as an argument means that you have a single target. You own, you're breaking something for Alice. You're not breaking it for Alice and Charlie and Dave and so on. Then a slight relaxation. Um, because we know that A times L is the group order, is a full order of points, we change the verification equation to include this 8. But you can also check the, the normal one without the 8, except for, for most routines, uh, we recommend to have the 8 in there because, well, getting A times P gets into the order L subgroup. This is definitely the order L subgroup, and this is. And then finally, the R value, uh, that was this random value picked at the beginning as a commitment, that one is chosen pseudo-randomly rather than randomly. Um, there have been some issues with bad randomness. I have a link on the next slide. Um, and so getting it depend on something else, which is sufficiently varying, is better than having something where the random number generator 
or might just get stuck. So the way it's chosen to do randomly is that you have, well, in addition to your secret key, the A, you also have another secret key, which is basically the seed for this pseudorandomness here. And so to get R, you actually compute a function on this extra seed key and the message it comes in, which means that if the message is the same, well, the seed is the same, so this will give you the same output, but if there's a change in the message, it will give you a different output. And since we know that there's a big problem if the R is the same for two different messages, uh, we do want to make sure that um, we don't get stuck with our R. So this is, this is helping against that. So for historical reasons, and it's still used in some places, so Ed2519 is the new kit on the blog. You can see this now in your browser. If you're using SSH for computers, you can do it there. It is very nice because your keys are just 255 bits. Um, but it's not the first scheme. So already late 90s, the ECDSA scheme was proposed, which stands for Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm. It is a very similar setup but it's not really using the Schnorr equation. Um, I wasn't around when that happened, but history has it, or rumor has it, that the main reason for changing the signature equation was patent avoidance. So the Schnorr patent, so Schnorr patented his invention, this data flow we've just seen, but it was long ago that it's expired by now. But late 90s, early 2000s, that patent hadn't expired, and so they went through length to, well, make it look very, very different. So well, let's start with the similar parts. So there's, again, a choice of R. There's, again, a computation of a point. This is already a bit different. We will need another integer mod n. So n is our group order again. Typically, that's L, so prime. And for this point R, we're taking the x coordinate, reducing that mod n, and putting this into R prime. So capital R prime is an integer mod n, um, and it's related to R. I'm writing it with R because it's related uh, with capital R because it's related to the public value. Of course, you can compute it from known the secret value r, lowercase r, but you can easily deduce it from knowing the uppercase r. And then the signature equation is this group here. So we're taking this r that we pick, we invert it. We have the hash of the message, and yes, ECDSA is just using the message. There's no R in there, there's no Q in there. And then we add to this this R prime that we've just computed, just the scalar here, times A. So the inner part looks fairly similar, except for, well, last time we had the A times H, and we had the R separately, and now we also have this R inverse. Now, how do you verify this? So the signature equation needs an inversion, the verification equation needs an inversion, so we compute the inverse of S mod n, and then we multiply it, or we compute two different values, once is times h, it's lowercase h on the previous slide, and once is times r prime, this integer mod n here. And then we compute the sum w1p plus w2q, and look at the x coordinate of this point, and ask, whether this matches the R prime. So the R prime in this case is not used in the computation. It's not an input, it's not summed up to something, but we verify that it's given the right result. This is a little bit similar to if we had moved the H times Q over to the other side and would just test whether SP minus HQ is equal to R. But here everything gets computed mod N, we will now, for the verification, uh, show that this point, this W1P plus WQ, actually should equal capital R, and then also the x coordinates match. Okay, so let's see how this works. So L of the signals are valid, that's the claim. So we now plug in W1 and W2 in these positions. So W1 from the S inverse H, and W2 from the S inverse R prime, and then well, both of these expressions have an S inverse, so we move that outside, and we also know that Q is A times P. So the S inverse moved on the outside, the Q gets replaced by A times P, and that's already everything that has happened. And then we look at the definition of S, that is up here. 
So if you take S inverse, then it's R times the inverse of this thing, also known as R times the inverse of this thing times this thing again, so R times 1. And so if it's a valid signature, then this actually will give you R times P, known as uppercase R. And then the R prime, well, is just the X coordinate of R taken mod N. And so yes, this should work. This scheme is similarly fragile to Schnorr, and therefore also at DSA, um, for reuse of R. So if you have the same R for two things, this is really, really bad. And so that was one of the reasons why we put for at DSA this dependence on the message. You can't just pick one. Um, you have to compute it in a way that would modify R if the message changes. But at 27 C3, so in 2010, there was a very nice talk, which I'm linking here, called PlayStation 3 Epic Fail. And that was going into how Sony had implemented ECDSA in a way where, well, their random choice probably was very random. It was a really, really good random number, so they put a lot of effort into getting it and then kept using it. So some notation, this R here is called a nonce. And nonce means it's a term of art. Yes, there is also an English word, but this is really as a term of art. The crypto usage is number used only once. And that is very descriptive. You must never ever use this number twice. So if you, um, if you encounter this number and you pick it once, you must not use it again, at least not if the message doesn't change. So if the message is the same, well, okay, you can say, sign the same thing twice, nothing bad happens. But using the same R for two different messages will relieve, uh, will leak your secret key A, and so that's a really bad thing. And so ECDSA is at least as fragile to it as ADSA is. And there we will see on, on Tuesday. That's the problem. Thank you.